All right, folks, welcome back. Today, we're going to continue our discussion of the next research challenge. It's going to be on. OK, so continue with the lecture. So we see a couple of multimodal challenges. We started from representation, where we had just assumed that there was one element in each modality, or you holistically aggregated each modality into one element, uh, red and blue. And representation study how we can learn better representations that take into account the information sharing and cross-modal interactions between those two modalities. So you saw three paradigms, right? Fusing representations for some task, learning one representation for each modality, and coordinating them through some function that is super helpful for retrieval, exemplified by models like CLIP. And we also saw factorization. So going from two elements to learning more representations, taking into account the different factors, the different shared information and unique information that might exist in your modalities. So that was your presentation. We then moved on to alignment. We saw what was the case where there were multiple elements across your modalities. For example, three elements, three words in your sentence, and four object regions in your image. And we saw that if you have multiple elements across your modalities, how can we learn better alignment between them? How can you know which word corresponds to which other um, image region in the image? And how can you do that? How can you use that to learn better representations for your sequential and temporal data? So we saw lots of examples of multimodal transformers and their extension to better capture alignment. In every problem, we typically have both representation and alignment. These are two of the most important challenges. And afterwards, we also moved on to reasoning, right? While most work today in representation and alignment work on black box, large neural networks, the whole goal of reasoning is to make the, the process, the decision-making process of your models more transparent. How can you actually uh, build implicit, explicit reasoning into your model, either in the form of sequential reasoning? So we saw some examples of reinforcement learning, we saw hierarchical reasoning in the form of tree graph structures. And we also saw how can you can you can add, for example, causal inference or logical inference into the reasoning process. The whole goal here is to make it more transparent, make it more robust, instead of just relying on black box large models. Um, usually when you predict a label, it's always a process of representation, alignment, and with or without reasoning to predict the label. But afterwards, we also call it generation, right? In the case where you don't want to predict a label, but you want to generate more data. And we saw three examples of large data to small summarization. Uh, same meaning, same content, but one modality to the other. That was translation. So a lot of interest in image to text, text to image translation nowadays. And we also saw some promising approaches, but still a big open research question. And that is going from small to big, going from small to variables to generating many modalities entirely. We saw generation, generative models, and so on. And today, we're going to continue on transference. Transference is a goal where you have lots of data and perhaps very good pre-trained models in one modality, over here in blue. But you have some other modality that you don't have that much data, or you have very little data, very little labels for. How can you use the data with uh, modalities with more data to help the modalities with less data? That's going to be on transference. And finally, next week, um, LP and I are going to wrap up on quantification. Quantification is all about coming up with a deeper theoretical and empirical understanding of all of these other basic challenges. Right? That's why you have the magnifying glass. It's not about new approaches, but better ways to understand your existing approaches. So transference. Transference is all about transferring information between modalities, typically from a modality with more data or better pre-trained models to help one that has limited resources. We're going to see three sub-challenges. Uh, the first one is transfer. If you have a large pre-trained model, how can you best transfer information to other models? We're going to see co-learning, where the other modality can be used as an implicit signal, either in the input step or on the output step. And finally, we're going to see model induction. Model induction maintains two separate models, one for each modality, to separate models, but how they can interchange information to help each other. So three general paradigms for transference we're going to look at today. So firstly, transfer by pre-trained models. So when you think of these pre-trained models nowadays, they're mostly generative models, right? We have lots of strong models that were pre-trained, 
self-supervised styles, word language model, stable diffusion, train on lots of unlabeled data. The goal is to adapt them to work for some other modality in which you have less data, right? And in fact, when you think of this general paradigm, we've already seen several examples of it. Uh, most of these larger models from modality B with lots more data are typically these generative models, like your language models, right? So you can use language models as a backbone and transfer this information to other tasks, in this case, visual question answering. So this is mostly a recap, but quite a lot of the work in generation also overlaps a little bit with transfer. Right? We saw how we could take language models that were frozen. These frozen language models can contain lots of language-based knowledge, not specific to this visual question answering task, Right. Normally you would train this visual question answering task just using supervised data. But now you can use these large language models with general linguistic knowledge. They can help you in these visual question answering tasks. And a general paradigm we saw two weeks ago is that if you have this frozen language model pre-trained, you can then train these adapter models that are taking your image and train using just a very few, very small set of parameters, you can adapt these image representations into language model inputs. You can do this multiple times. And finally, if you want to give it a new image and these two examples, it can reliably answer your questions for this new image given these two examples. Right? The example here was that you have an apple and you're saying this is a DAX. You have an orange, you're saying this is a blicket. You give it an apple in a new orientation. You ask what this is. It should very quickly learn the association between the word DAX and the image apple. Right? So I'll put this as a DAX. So you see some of these examples before, but in general, these are ways of doing transfer. You have a large model pre-trained on usually the language modality. You can adapt it either from the adapter side at the input level. You can also adapt at the representation level. Right? You can open up these language models. You can get the internal features. And you can adapt it using other modalities inputs. We saw some examples of how you can use auto modalities to learn a feature which then shifts the language feature. The language feature is the best, right? The language feature is from the pre-trained model is probably the most informative. You probably only want to shift it by a little bit to learn what the other modalities contribute in your task. And this works really well. This works really well for these cases where the person might be speaking and there's some audio visual information of the person's faces. You might not have that much data to learn directly from audio visual but you can use what the person is saying and use the language model features in order to better predict what the person was, was feeling. Okay, So visually, what it looks like is that without audiovisual, the language embedding is just a point. That's already quite informative. But the idea is that with audiovisual, you're only going to shift that language representation by a little bit, either in the positive direction or in the negative direction. Okay, and just to summarize, we've seen quite a few examples of how you can use pre-trained models to transfer. A lot of it is falls under the categories of conditioning pre-trained models. If you just have a pre-trained model, for example, in image space or in language space, that can only do one task, right? But if you want to adapt it to some other task, you can usually be seen as conditioning on this other task, latent variables. So you saw how you can use conditioning, you can do prompt tuning, you can do representation tuning, you can change the classifiers, where your new model is a function of both the unconditional model and the conditional model with a classifier y given x. Right. So that's mostly a recap from generation, how generative models, large generative model train a lost amount of data can help you transfer to other modalities. Beyond generative models, another promising paradigm is to train things in a multitask manner. Right? If you don't have that much data from a single task, for example, if I care about these three separate tasks, and I really care about robotics, right? I want to learn how to use video and time series to fuse a representation useful for robotics. But the problem is I'm not going to have that much data for robotics. Right? So what do I do? I can take more data that slightly overlaps with my modalities. For example, I can take lots of audio video data for human faces. I can also take lots of video, audio language data for general videos, for example, YouTube videos. And the hope is to train one model for everything. 
so that you can learn informative features about video and audio from your larger data sets for video classification and human videos and have it transferred to robotics in which you don't have that much data. Right, so that's the goal of doing multitask learning of one big model that can then transfer to data sets or tasks that you don't have that many data for. And you saw some examples of this, um, high MMP model and also the Gato model from DeepMind, where you can train a single model for many different things. For robotics, you have images, you have actions, proprioception, the pose of the robots. You might have audio video in the case of faces and other generic videos from YouTube. The key idea is to standardize everything into one input sequence because all data nowadays can roughly abstract it away, can roughly be seen as a sequence, right? Language can be seen as a sequence of words, video a sequence of frames, even these actions, even these robot actions can be seen as a sequence of actions one at a time. Append a modality specific embedding to them. That tells you that this is language and this separate one hot embedding represents audio. This separate one hot embedding represents video. And also it makes clear that video, for example, is shared between your first, second, and third tasks. You're gonna train a shared model. These shared models are typically based on multimodal transformers. It's a quite generic model. And finally, you can append task-specific classifiers onto each head in order to predict different tasks, right? So for example, DeepMind's Gato model also does it for Atari games from previous frames, trying to predict the next action, autoregressively. So frame, action, frame, action, frame, action, and also for robots. And so these are task-specific classifiers. And you can train everything together using multitask learning. So using the same model parameters and the same architecture, you can then train one model for many different tasks in which all of them share information. Usually starts with a one hot embedding, um, which is then trainable. So language would be one zero zero video zero one zero and so on, and you get trainable. But these methods work quite well. They can, you can pre-train them on a couple of data sets in which you might have more data and then subsequently transfer them to tasks in which you have less data and perhaps even new modalities. Both the high MMT and Gato paper investigated this transfer scenario, both the multitask and the transfer scenario. And if you pre-train on enough tasks, right, the more pre-trained tasks that you have, the better you can transfer. So here I was showing transfer to this healthcare data set, Mimic, in which there's a time series of patient medical sensors, time series data, and you also have tabular data of patient uh, history, medical histories. And you're pre-training from different modalities and different tasks. So you can pre-train on video data, you see some time series, you see some time series in robotics, you see some tabular data in some other modality, but you don't actually see healthcare data, right? So you pre-train all these other tasks, but you can still transfer to this new task in healthcare. Likewise, the other example here is for your funny, that's a human prediction task. You've not really seen humor before, but you've seen videos of general YouTube videos. You've seen general videos of happy, sadness. You train on more of them. You can then transfer to tasks involved. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the short answer is, well, there's a couple of explanations. One is that no matter what modality you use, there is some shared information. There is some shared syntactic information around it because all of these at the end of the day are still time series, right? Sequence of words, sequence of images, sequence of sequence of um, even like medical recordings. There's been a bunch of works in the past couple of years showing that even if you train a transformer model on text, text only, it can still transfer to like robotics or still transfer to even like numbers and so on. Yeah, of course you need some fine tuning. It's not gonna transfer that straight up zero shot, but even if you fine tune on very few examples, it can reach just if you had trained supervised with lots of examples. And the main hypothesis is that in general time series have some structure to them. There is some uh, temporal structure where maybe nearby elements are important and your model has learned to attend to these nearby elements or your model has learned to autoregressively 
accumulate information. So no matter whether it's text or video or robotics or sensors, there's some general pattern in time series data. That's the intuition, of course, no one really knows for sure. But based on that intuition, you have people training language models and you can just directly use them for robotics actions or directly using them for numbers, or like financial time series and so on. The other implication of that is that you can also, and I've seen some work in this, I don't know the exact paper, but you can generate synthetic language data by just defining a synthetic grammar, right? And generating unlimited data from that. And you can also use that to train reasonably good sequence models without even going to actual language. So the first hypothesis, like general, generally time series data, no matter what modality, has some structure to them. And this structure is shared across many modalities. Um, over here, there's still gonna be some overlap, right? So over here we see, for example, in this like, uh, you're funny, that's predicting humor. There's a bit more overlap because you've seen videos from YouTube. You see videos from human faces, and this is transferring to videos collected from some TV show. So there's still all videos. So the input is there's some match. The task also has some match, right? Even though you're not literally annotating data for humorous or not in your pre-training, you're still seeing at least happiness and sadness. You're still seeing people laugh around. So it's gonna learn some general purpose features. But yeah, I mean, if you ask the research community, I think they're pretty much split. I think there's gonna be some amount of people in multimodal who think that this and scaling these types of paradigms up is the future, right? Taking all the different modalities and all the different tasks in the world and learning one generic world model that can work for everything. And the hope is that if you have enough of these modalities and tasks and your model has high enough capacity, then you should be able to transfer to anything. Of course, there's also a lot of people who believe that uh, task-specific, domain-specific methods are going to be more useful, especially in the real-world settings where you may not care about transfer, but you care about doing one task really well and even really transparently, right? If I just want to work with, uh, with doctors and define a task for medical data, I'm just going to build one that is very transparent, very reliable, very robust just for doctors. So general paradigms, two different paradigms. But of course, it's worth thinking that a lot of these large, many, many modalities models make a lot of implicit assumptions. One implicit assumption is that all modalities can be represented as sequences across individual tokens without losing information. Uh, so that's a big assumption, right? If you assume that images are made out of sequence or patches, that's already losing a lot of uh, spatial information. If you're working with a time series, it's also not super clear how you would segment things one token at a time, right? Because a lot of these time series are continuous in nature. It's not clear like text, how you would tokenize across time. So a lot of these methods typically end up making a lot of assumptions and probably a lot of performance drops is due to the assumptions in the standardized input sequence. Another big assumption is that your heterogeneity can be exactly captured by a modality specific embeddings. Um, so just one single one hot embedding is able to distinguish and capture all the differences between video and audio. May or may not be true. Again, worth revisiting. And of course, all your cross-modal connections, all your cross-modal interactions can be perfectly shared and captured by one single model with one set of parameters. But yeah, whether all of these assumptions are true or not, open questions for future work. But otherwise, I'm just gonna leave you with this figure. Um, these are names of models that have come out in the past couple of years, mostly in the multimodal multitask space. Uh, several open challenges. How do you go beyond language and vision? A lot of these are still within language and vision. How do you actually get it to work for real world sensory data? How do you get it working for modalities where deep learning is not state of the art? For example, tabular data, right? And of course, all these come at the disadvantage that they become much more complex and less interpretable. 
right? So there's some open challenges and how do you um, improve these multimodal, multitask models to have all these other properties as well. Okay. Honestly, I don't think much thought has gone into this step based on literature. It's usually a hacky way where any modality that you have, you try to convert it into a sequence. So language will be a sequence of words or, or like byte pair encodings, whatever tokenization method you choose. Image will be, you cut it into like four by four, include like 16 patches. Um, audio, video, time series, any other time series data, just chunk it based on time maybe with like a fixed duration. So I, I will say it's a challenge. It's an open question whether these things work and if you can actually improve the tokenization. Um, of course, it would be great if you can improve the tokenization such that the alignment is easier for the model to learn. A lot of these methods, they tokenize uh, in time so that, for example, the, the first second, you have a token, video, audio, maybe text. The second, 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 video, audio, text. Third second, video, audio, text. So tokenizing like this. So uh, you're, making, you're basically making the assumption that your data has to be aligned in time. So if I have some, if I see something and I maybe only respond to it like 10 seconds later, then it's up to the model to kind of figure out these associations. You're not actually capturing this alignment when you're sequencing, sequencing your data. Yes. Yeah, great question. Uh, we'll get to the next part. So in fact, we've seen that previously in coordination, where the goal is to just learn coordinated representation. So you could do retrieval and, and like that stuff. Uh, we're going to see very quickly how that can be useful for transference as well. Great. So yeah, so that actually falls into this, co-learning. Um, in co-learning, it's not so much about transfer from one modality to the other, but the goal is to use both modalities and train a single model, after which you will discard the modality that you don't care about, okay? So typically we see it like this, right? Modality A is a modality that you care about. We have the bold arrow. Modality B is a modality that's supposed to help you during training. We show that using a dashed arrow because it's gonna help you during training, but during test time, you're gonna throw it away, right? It can be seen as um, extra auxiliary data during training. And you, the hope is that during training using both modalities to learn a better representation space that is co-learned, after which you can just during testing use prediction on modality A. And modality A is still the one that you're gonna care about. So what's an example of this? Um, people have been doing this for quite some time. Back in the days of images, CFR10 classification, and word embeddings. So the goal here is to try to predict the category for images. Right, so you have see some cars, you have some trucks, you have some cats, dogs, horses, and so on. So normally, if you try to do image classification, you just take a bunch of images and you try to, you know, with labels, do supervised learning, right? Predict a label. But then the question becomes, can you do better than that? Can you actually use some semantic information about how the labels relate to each other to better help your classification? And one neat idea is to use word embeddings, right? All of these labels are just words, right? They're auto, truck, horse, dog, and so on. They're just words. Can I use word embeddings to tell me more about the geometry of how these different labels relate to each other? For example, word embeddings will tell me that auto and truck are very close to each other, right? If you just train word embeddings, auto and truck are very close to each other. So in other words, I can learn which image features are close to truck even without training on these images. Similarly, my word embeddings tell me that horse and dog are close to each other. They're both animals. So that means if I see some images of dogs and I project them into this label space, I can also very quickly learn which embedding should be that for horses, right? So how do they do this? They do this in coordination, right? You take these images, you embed them into image features. You take the label and you embed it into a word embedding feature and you try to make sure they're close together. So you end up learning a representation space that is coordinated between image features and text features, where here the text features are shown in the circles. So truck, auto, horse, and dog. And all these image embeddings are shown as triangles, diamonds, and these pluses, right? So all the images of dogs become embedded you know, roughly around um, 
the word embedding for dog as a center. All the image embeddings for horses become embedded roughly around the cluster with a horse embedding. The word embedding is in the center. Right, so that's representation coordination. And a very cool thing is that if you then given a new uh, image, for example, an image of a cat, when you embed the image of a cat into a representation space, you can then retrieve what is the nearest word embedding to that image embedding, right? And because you know the geometry, you know that cats and dogs are close to each other, you can actually retrieve that the nearest word embedding for that should be cat, right? So you can do zero shot learning. And again, why is this co learning? It's co learning because um, during training, you have images and text both coming in to learn a representation space that is coordinated. But after training, you throw away your word embeddings. Right? You don't have to take word embeddings as input anymore. You only take images in a test time. And nowadays, people scale this up. Right? You don't just train small images and word embeddings to do coordination. You can train large images and lots of captions for the images to do coordination. So this paper called Scaling Up Visual and Visual Language Representation Learning Using Noisy Text Supervision. During pre-training, you can take lots of noisy image text data, images, and lots of text. Use contrastive learning to learn an embedding space that is shared between images and captions. And this can transfer really well to zero-shot vision tasks. So during testing, I'm just going to test on ImageNet. I'm going to use the image encoder here and just plug it onto ImageNet and learn a classifier. And that can work as well as supervised learning or even better than supervised learning on ImageNet. Of course, if you do this, it can also do well for multimodal tasks, right? You can do well for image text retrieval on Flickr and MS Coco, image captioning, and so on. But that's obvious. We already know that. We already know that if you do representation coordination, you can do these tasks. The key difference in transference is you're doing multimodal coordination during training but it can still work well for vision-only tasks during testing. Uh, yeah, so in this case, your pre-training is on this coordination. Okay. I take images, image embeddings, word, word embeddings, and I try to match them up with each other. Mm -hmm. So that gives me a coordinated space with image embeddings and word embeddings all in the space. Right? During testing, all you do is take a new image, use the image encoder that I've trained. Trains in coordination, right? I'm going to take the image encoder that I've trained and just project it into the space and retrieve the nearest word embedding. And that tells me what category my image should be. Right, So you can do zero shot image classification. Right. Cool. But well, that's a great question because you have this mismatch between training, which is multimodal, and testing, which is unimodal, right? And so there's mismatch in data. In the previous two examples, we also saw a slight mismatch in objectives. During training, you train with multimodal coordination, so you didn't actually have any task. And your testing was single modal, vision only, for a task. So actually mismatch in both uh, training data and task. There's several works that look at co-learning um, we you actually train for a supervised task during training as well. So these methods fall under representation fusion. Fusion because we're fusing modalities for some prediction task, not coordination. So what we would do during training is that you have two modalities, for example, A and B. And why is this task, for example, sentiment, happy, happy or sad, okay? So during training, I will take both modalities in, I will learn representations, I will fuse them and try to predict sentiment. During testing, I'm going to take the first modality. I'm still going to have it, for example, language. And I'm going to remove the second modality from the model. So perhaps give it all zeros or give it, by the, give it the average value for vision in the second modality. And I'm just going to use that to infer what the label should be given only language modality. So here I'm doing essentially language only sentiment analysis. So training will be multimodal sentiment, happy, sad, language and vision both. Testing will be language only sentiment. Using language, pretty happy or sad when vision is just filling in by zeros or the average video feature. 
What do I compare this, this to? I compare it with unimodal learning. We're doing training. I have language, trying to predict happy or sad. And during testing, I also just use language to predict happy or sad. And we actually find that multimodal co-learning can improve over unimodal language only learning. Right. And only text is used at test time. So during testing, you're having a fair comparison between language only with vision being zeros and language only into a language only model. Mm -hmm. So somehow during training, using the other modality, for example, visual nonverbal behaviors to predict sentiment can help you even though you're only using language at testing. So here's an example where training and testing has a modality mismatch. You have two modalities input at training. You only have one of them at testing. The other modality you just put in zeros, but the task is the same in both training and testing. Right. An exact way that representation, the exact way that core learning is done is through representation fusion. Any questions? It's very useful. Um, the way I'm thinking about it is that, let's say I want to do language only, no, language only sentiment analysis, right? Normally you would just train using language only sentiment analysis, but a key implication here is that sometimes if you train with language, but also non-verbal behaviors, it can learn a more enriched language representation for the same task. Okay. So that was all co-learning with the other modality in the input space, right? If the other modality is in the input, you can either coordinate or you can fuse during training and at test time, throw the other modality away and just use the one that you care about. The other paradigm is to do it in the output space where modality A is again the one that you care about. I'm gonna to try to learn a representation where B is trying to be, where you're trying to make the model predict B, the other modality at the output space. So again, you're going to train it to predict some representation that is also able to predict B during training. Um, after I've done training it, I'm going to throw B away. And I'm just going to use the representation to predict my task during testing. So some examples of this, um, learning with latent language. Latent language, because language only provided during training, and you're going to throw it away subsequently. But what these folks do is that you're going to take some of these images, uh, images of a bunch of shapes and different positions. You're going to put it through a model and try to predict what caption it was. Right? Try to predict that a red cross is below a square. So essentially doing image captioning during training. They say this is auxiliary training because I'm going to do image captioning during training. But afterwards, I'm going to throw it away. I'm going to throw away the captioning head and all I'm going to keep is the visual embedding that was useful for decoding the caption. At testing, I'm then going to just do whatever I want, do like question answering, do prediction using this feature that I've learned. Right. So the key idea is that during training, image captioning with predicting language can be useful for testing where you're just trying to do some question answering or some prediction task on the image itself. So predicting language can be helpful. Another example with language and visual gestures, normally you would take in both modalities and try to predict the label, right? But instead, co-learning, what would you do? It would say you're taking language, you will learn a representation, and this representation would then try to predict vision. At the same time, I'm going to use the representation to predict my label. So all this is done during training. So training, you need pair data, language, vision, and the label. It shows that instead of language and vision coming in to predict the label, you take the language to the feature and you predict both vision and the label, right? That's done during training. Cross-modal translation is done during training, but when I'm testing it, I'm gonna throw my vision away and I'm just gonna do inference. Where language comes in, I infer the feature and I use the prediction head that I've trained during training to infer the label. Right, so only language modalities revolve, are required uh, during test time. So somehow during training, 
just by predicting the visual feature. It has enriched the representation that you learn. Yeah, we're literally predicting frames. Yeah. This is the case of predicting frames. You can use like a mean squared error loss. I mean, this was back in 2018, but nowadays you can probably put in the better you know, generative models. So the language comes in, you can plug it to a generative model and predict the visual features. And that can enrich the language representation that you learn. Uh, this was predicting the caption, right? During training, I have image captioning. Use image to predict a caption. That will be auto regressively through a LSTM word by word. Uh, and after that, I've learned a visual feature that is able to be predictive of the caption. During testing, I throw the caption away. I use that visual feature for whatever downstream task. So a cool extension uh, that this paper also showed to, is that to better encourage you to predict a vision, you can do both forward and backward translations, right? So you take language, you predict a feature. The feature should predict the vision. Whatever vision you predict, you go back to the feature and you go back to the language. So it's kind of like cycle again, if, if folks have seen that, right? You force language, predict the vision, and whatever vision you predict that you force it to recreate the language. And that encourages it to, to um, retain as much information as possible from the language. But same thing is still called learning, right? During test time inference, you just do inference from language to the feature and feature through the classification head to the label, right? So it still respects this, this, this figure where the external modality, the other modality is used as a prediction target during training, but afterwards you throw it away. Okay, final example. Folks have also tried to train language models using this image prediction objective, right? Normally you train or you pre-train BERT um, using mass language modeling. Humans, something language by something. Um, you're gonna mask out certain words and you try to predict the, the words that were missing, right? Humans learn language by listening and speaking. These folks show that if you had paired data between text and images, you can not only mask out the text, and try to predict the missing tokens, but you can also try to predict the missing visual features at the same time. They call this visual tokens, so they call it a Vulcan, and they call it vulcanization as the entire model. And same thing, once you've trained a uh, language to kind of predict both to missing tokens and also predict images during training, afterwards, you're gonna remove the decoder head. All you're gonna keep is the inference to the BERT features. Right, so only language is required at test time. And it showed that multimodal co-learning, so multimodal mass modeling is better than language only mass modeling when they scale it up with language models. But of course you gotta revisit what do these methods learn? If you're trying to predict something, you're trying to predict B from A, you can only possibly learn the information in both modalities, right? If A is language, B is visual, you can't, possibly learn what is in visual that's not in language. But essentially what you're doing is trying to encourage the model to not learn language only things, but to learn something that is shared between both language and vision. Right. Encouraging it to learn the information in both modalities. And if the task does require information in both modalities, then this could be seen as a way to better encourage a model to learn that informative part. If the task requires something in vision, not in language, then doing this cross-modal prediction wouldn't help, right? It's impossible to learn what is unique in vision without vision actually being as input. Yeah? But co-learning may not always work. Um, it seems nice that you, know, you can train with lots of modalities, learn generic things about the world and have it transferred to text, vision, audio, one by one. The hope is to build these big models over many modalities, many tasks, but sometimes it doesn't work. So what these folks showed is that they compared BERT, BERT is just trained on language, right? And visual BERT, visual BERT is trained, well, both video BERT and visual BERT. Video BERT trained on language and videos, visual BERT trained on language and images. And I'm gonna take these three pre-trained models, language only, language video, uh, language and, and images, and I'm gonna put them on, test them on some downstream language only tasks. So these are language only tasks that are more more semantic, more sentence level, 
SRL is semantic role labeling. For example, the carrots are then pureed in the food processor. Do you know that carrots are the things that are being pureed? Entity co-reference, after the apples are chopped, put them in a bowl. Do you know that then refers to apple? All these lexical tasks. And you show that BERT still performs the best. And if you start training with more videos or images, the performance actually decreases. Right. So co-learning may not always work for some tasks. Uh, why? People don't really know. These are just empirical studies. Sometimes it works. We've shown lots of examples where it works. Here are just some empirical studies to show when it doesn't work. Right. In fact, even some seemingly multimodal tasks, it seems to not help as well. Uh, not, not help as well. So here's an example of again, you start from BERT, video BERT, visual BERT, three pre trained models, and I'm going to take them and apply them on physical common sense QA. Uh, one example of that is you know, if you want to remove your gloss from furniture. I should rub the furniture with either a steel wool or a cotton ball. And your goal is to choose the right material, the right object to, to use it. Uh, and you should choose cotton ball. So that's an example of physical common sense QA data set. And it seems like physical common sense QA is something that should improve if you have further trained with videos and images, right? Uh, perhaps during videos, you see what a cotton ball looks like. You see more videos or images of furniture. It should improve. but but it shows that there's only marginal improvements, right? Video bird helps a little bit, but not statistically significant. And visual bird just doesn't help at all. It makes the performance um, slightly worse in some cases. So again, why, why is that the case? People don't really know. These still open questions where the co-learning, you know, when co-learning works and when it doesn't work. Okay. Any final questions about this, about co-learning? Cool. Final paradigm, model induction. So transfer was about big model transferring to a small model. Co-learning was about using both modalities to learn a single model, either with this extra modality in the input or in the output. Model induction is going to keep separate models. Right? You're going to keep a separate model for A, a separate model for B, this can be much more useful if you don't really want to do any more training or kind of writing code to make some models. I'm going to keep separate models. And by keeping separate models, I'm going to exchange information even though the models are separate. So to see how we do that, we're going to go through a classic example of model induction. It's called uh, co-training. Co-training is going to start with several assumptions. Again, it's going to start with the assumption that the information required for the task is perfectly in the middle. Right, perfectly shared between modalities. In fact, most of the co-learning stuff we talk about when you transfer, we're all making this assumption that uh, the information is shared between modalities. Right? As we saw in the case of, of co-learning, it's not really going to work if there's unique information in one. Sorry, there's unique information in one not present in the other. Uh, co-training is good because it's, it's a bit more formal. It started from machine learning theoretical people. Uh, so they formalize this assumption as the fact that x1 and x2 are independent given y. So what it basically means is that y in some sense explains all the difference between x1 and x2. If I show you what y is, there's no more additional information in x1 and x2. They become independent. Uh, so visually, what that also looks like is the fact that x1 and x2 share no mutual information given y. And if you recall, these are these mutual information diagrams. Conditioning on y basically means that so let's say this is y, right? This circle is y. Conditioning on, on a variable basically means you don't observe, you remove that area, right? So if you remove this area, you blank it out, then you see that language and vision, they don't overlap anymore. So that's a more formal way of saying that uh, the only information required for the task is that which is shared between your modalities. It is typically called multi-view redundancy assumption. It can be equivalently seen as there's no unique information in language, useful for the task, and there's no unique information and vision important for the task. Uh, some other assumptions for it to work is that it also also be sufficient in the sense that because the information required is in the middle, right, share between both, if I have enough x1 to y data, I should be able to perfectly put in the task. Uh, 
in a variety of x to the y data, I should also be perfectly, should also perfectly be able to predict the task. Okay. Several assumptions of code learning, code training to work. So what is code training? Um, we're going to start with a single view. Code training, the single view version is called self-training. And in fact, many of you might have seen self-training nowadays. It has come kind of come up with a resurgence with um, self-supervised learning unlabeled data. But essentially what you do is that there's some labeled data that you have, labeled to Y, and there's lots of unlabeled data, right? Very reminiscent of nowadays self-supervised learning perspective. But what you're gonna do when you have unlabeled data and labeled data is that you're gonna first train a classifier on the limited label data that you have, F1. Usually this label data is very small, so the classifier that you start with may not be very good. We typically call these like weak classifiers. Um, the only requirement is that your weak classifier is a little bit better than random, right? You can prove that even if it's just a little bit better than random, it can keep improving and get better. It can't be worse than random, can, it can get worse, but it has to be a little bit better than random. So I'm gonna use this classifier to label the most confident examples in my unlabeled data, where there is some definition of confidence. It can be through a softmax, or it can be based on distance from the decision boundary, the further away, the more confident. I'm gonna label some unlabeled examples, and I'm gonna add it to the label set. So whatever unlabeled example it was, I'm gonna use F1 to label it, to get a Y. And even though this Y is predicted by my model, I'm gonna treat it as a ground truth and add it to my label data. So you see that your label data set slowly increases, right? Uh, it slowly increases not with real label data, which you would normally get through a human annotator, but using pseudo label data labeled by your existing classifier. And you're gonna keep repeating this. You're gonna keep retraining your classifier on this slightly larger expanded label set. You're gonna use that to label more examples, put that into my label data, becomes bigger. You're gonna retrain your classifier again on this slightly larger label set and so on and so forth until you've exhausted all your unlabeled data. And during testing for a new, new sample, new test time sample, use a classifier, predict the label. So to see how these things work in practice visually, um, you have some examples, red and blue, red for one class, blue for one class. They're all triangles because they're all the same modality. So you start by training a classifier, right? On this initial small amount of label data that you have, you see you have some unlabeled data points, um, more unlabeled data points. They're unshaded because they're unlabeled, but you're gonna use your current version of your classifier to label these unlabeled data points, right? Label them meaning if they're on one side of the decision boundary, they're one class, if they're on the other side, they're the other class. But the key thing is, when you do this pseudo labeling, we only wanna pseudo label the most confident ones. So in this case, the most confident ones are the ones that are furthest away from the boundary, right? Very confidently left or blue, very confidently red. These two that are right slightly in the middle, you can see they're ambiguous, uh, you're not gonna label them. And in fact, this decision boundary currently gets this point wrong, right? It kind of gets it slightly wrong. So once I add these confident data points back into my training data, I'm going to retrain my classifier. So my decision boundary changes. Right. Given this new set of blue points and new set of red points, I'm going to retrain my classifier because the blue points are very much to the right. Your classifier boundary also shifts. And when your classifier boundary shifts, now it's much more suitable for classifying these new unlabeled points. You can classify them correctly, red or blue. Uh, yes, these things are sensitive, um, but there are theoretical guarantees you can prove about these things. In practice, there are also ways to make it much more stable. I'm gonna go through some of these assumptions in a bit. Okay. Uh, if you're interested, I mean, I won't have time to go through everything, but the key words are you know, semi-supervised learning, label propagation, domain adaptation, domain shift, if you wanna look more for these resources. But there's several critical assumptions, right? The first assumption is that you can't label all your unlabeled data in one round. It has to be incremental, right? If you just label all your unlabeled data in one round, then you don't get any benefit, right? Whatever classifier you had, you're just gonna 
retrain your original classifier on all the label data. And you're just limited to the small amount of label data that you have. So this gradual shift, this gradual sequence of pseudo labeling based on what is the most confident and what is less confident is very important because you wanna gradually shift the decision boundary. And another big assumption is that there must be some consistency in the input space. In other words, no, the position of these points and what labels they belong to is super important, right? Usually we call this a uh, label consistency. In other words, uh, data points with similar features are gonna be roughly labeled in the same way. Of course, there are ways to get around this input consistency restraint, usually by augmenting your data, because if you know what the label for this feature is, and you can kind of create other features nearby to it by data augmentation with small amounts of differences, and you can label them to the same label, that can substantially help your algorithm. And likewise, adding noise can also be a good example, right? You have an image, you add a bunch of noise to it, the feature stays roughly the same, it's still the same label. So you do this properly, you can get it to scale actually quite well, right? Nowadays, a lot of these um, image classifiers and, and these pre-trained models are changing some amount, some, some combination of these. We have lots of unlabeled data, but you have classifiers that pseudo-label your data, and you can use that to incrementally train your classifier. Any other questions about self-training before I move on to the multimodal version of it? Okay. So now we go from self-training to co-training, the multimodal version. In co-training, you're gonna assume two views or two modalities, X1 and X2. And using these two modalities, again, we're gonna assume there's some labeled data, there's some unlabeled data. And the key idea is that we're gonna have two separate classifiers, one from X2 to Y, and one from X1 to Y, and one from X2 to Y. Right, these classifiers are gonna be starting trained from the label data, and you're also gonna assume there's lots of unlabeled data for us to exploit, okay? Uh, similar assumptions, you this, the information should be shared between modalities. That means whatever information you're capturing from this, is only going to be the information that is common to both, right? So X1, I should be able to predict a label. X2, I should also be able to predict a label. And ideally, these views should be as independent as possible. So if I have labeled data in one modality about certain things, maybe that should be unlabeled in the other modality. If I have lots of labeled data about certain things, that should help the unlabeled data in the other modality. It doesn't really help when, it doesn't really help when uh, the labeled data from both modalities tell you about the same things. Okay, so here's the algorithm. You're gonna start with some labeled data and lots of unlabeled data. I'm gonna first train a classifier F1 on my labeled data in the first modality and my classifier F2 on the labeled data in the second modality. Again, these classifiers might start off not very good, just slightly better than random chance because you don't have that much labeled data to begin with. So using my classifier F1, I'm going to label the most confident examples in my unlabeled data. So whichever X1 unlabeled was the most confident, and I'm gonna add it to the label set, but I'm gonna use it to train F2, right? So in other words, whatever I add to the label set is the X2 corresponding to that X1. So X2 as input, and the Y will be the one that's labeled by F1, right? So classifier F1 is gonna label data that is going to use to train F2. And vice versa, I'm gonna use classifier F2 to label the most confident data that is going to be used to train X1, right? So X1 is going to be the input and Y is going to be the label labeled by F2 on X2, okay? So that allows me to expand both my X1 label data set and X2 label data set I'm gonna use that to retrain my classifier on the larger version of these unimodal label data sets and repeat. F1 is going to label data to train F2 and F2 is going to label data to train F1. Finally, during testing, if I have a new unlabeled sample X1, X2, I'm going to take an ensemble F1 of X1 and F2 of X2. Over here, ensembling works 
and there's no need to do any fusion because we already assume that this is mostly just shared information between X1 and X2. So if I F1 and F2 should tell you the same answer. So to see this in practice, um, I'm gonna run through an example that was first given in the original paper on co-training. Uh, that's the paper, by the way, if you wanna look at the, the mathematical details. The original example operated using X1 and X2 as both uh, web pages, right? The goal back then was to classify web pages into certain categories. X1 was the text on the web page itself. X2 is a text on hyperlinks pointing into that web page. Why? Your goal is to categorize the web page into academics, sports, news, and so on. So here's two examples. So that's LP's web page. LP's web page, I'm going to choose that as X1. All the text on LP's web page is observed by the model. It's X1. And that's my web page. My web page is one that points into LP's. OK? So my web page is going to be X2 in this case. X2, the text on my website, which points into LP's website. So I'm going to assume that LP's website is originally labeled. That's maybe the one labeled example that I start with. If I have a labeled example, I can learn from the text on LP's website that, for example, CMU, the indication of the word CMU, indicates that it is an academic website. OK, so that's the first kind of piece of evidence I have that I train my classifier. So my classifier F1, all it knows is that CMU maps to academic. I also learned uh, classifier F2. That's the text on my website, which points into LP, right? There are some words on my website that says advised by LP, right before I say, right before I reference the LP. So it learns that the, the phrase advised by is also something that academics typically use, OK? So those are my initial classifiers, F1 and F2. So now you go to my website. Let's assume my, my website is unlabeled, so there's no labels for it. But now you can label using F1 and F2. In this case, CMU also appears on my website, right? CMU also appears on my website, so I can use F1 that I've learned that maps from CMU to academic to label my website as being academic, right? So now I know the label for my website. I'm going to use that label to train F2, right? Because this label came from F1, from just a text on my website, classifying the label. I'm going to use that label to train F2. What is F2? F2 is a text on all the other websites that point into mine, right? So let's say MLD's website points into mine. MLD's website points into mine. And maybe there's a text that says PhD program represents academic. So that's a new piece of evidence I learned about F2. And finally, I can go to some other student. Again, this other student is unlabeled. I'm going to use F2. F2 has the knowledge that PhD program points into academic. So for example, if this other student is at Berkeley, and Berkeley CS webpage has a list of PhD students, including this one, I'm going to use that information using inference to predict that this uh, website is academic. And I can then learn based on whatever information is on that student's website. For example, Berkeley does lots of robotics research. That student might be doing robotics. I learned the new evidence for F1 that robotics is academic. OK? Make sense? So starting from F1, F1 labels my website to gain new information for F2. F2 labels some other student in this Berkeley's PhD program that labels F1. So you have this cross view labeling. Each view's classifier is labeling the data in the other view. And of course, we saw how these assumptions work, right? Each view can predict the label. In this case, there's no unique information. If I have information on my website and I can classify my website, I should be able to learn it as academic. If I can classify all the websites that point into me, like CMU's website uh, and so on, that should also be labeled as academic. So it's mostly working in the shared information space. And also we saw that a key idea is that these views should be independent as possible, right? So whatever labeled data I have of a modality, that should inform me about the unlabeled data in some other modality. You don't want the labeled data to overlap in what they teach you. Visually, um, let me just go through the example as well. This is my first modality, triangles. <clears throat> 
there's some red and some blue. I'm going to use that to learn a classifier for triangles. Similarly, I have some circles. That's my second modality, some red, some blue. I'm going to use that to learn a classifier for circles. Right? That's the very first step. Using those classifiers, I'm going to pseudo label. If I have a bunch of new data points coming in as unlabeled, again, some of these circles are triangles, some are a circle, some are triangles, right? I'm going to first use the triangle decision boundary to pseudo label circles, right? One becomes blue, one becomes red. I'm going to use the circles decision boundary to pseudo label triangles. Both are on the same side, so both become blue, okay? Using this new set of circles and triangles that are both labeled, I'm going to retrain my classifiers. Starting from the triangles, you've added a bunch of new blue triangles here. The new classifier might look like this. Now I'm going to train a new classifier for circles. I've added a red circle here, a blue circle here. The classifier for circle might look like this. Eventually, eventually geometrically, both of these circle and triangle classifiers are going to meet and point in the same direction. Of course, the big assumption is that your views agree with each other. You're operating within the shared information between both modalities. OK. So again, same intuitions. Either view is sufficient. You're operating with the shared information. View should be as independent as possible. The input consistency is still very important. But in this case, the input consistency is obtained from the data from the other view, right? If I don't know about this particular space from the first modality, the other modality should help me supplement that space. Right? And of course, both views must agree. Eventually, you will converge on two classifiers that agree at each separate both views. And of course, lots of recent applications. Video and audio, our representation learning, um, the two modalities are RGB and flow. RGB is uh, the color, the, the, the actual pixels of the person taking the actions. <laughs> flow is just another way of representing uh, what is moving the most in the images. That's an, a recent example of co-training. You can read the paper for more details. Another cool example of co-training is that you can also co-train a large language model with a small language model. So GBT3 can be used to co-train BERT. Um, they, they can eventually help each other. Here's, a, here's another example where you don't want to kind of take BERT and like embed it into GBT3 or take GBT3 and like predict BERT's embeddings. Right? You don't want to use the first two methods, right? Because that would require substantially changing a model architecture, substantially changing your prediction functions. But model induction is cool because you can keep both of these models separate, right? Maybe even just API access separate, but you can still interchange information based on how they pseudo label each other and have them co-learn from each other. You don't have to open up the API. You don't have to kind of predict one's embedding from the other as we saw in the first two examples of co-learning. And another extension of co-regularization is also quite similar you add a loss term to ensure both F1 and F2 predict the same thing. So this actually falls a little bit has relationship to representation coordination, where you have both your, your, your models and you want to encourage them to predict the same thing, encourage them to agree on what they're predicting. Okay. But of course, all this is limited. It's only going to capture the information that is shared to both modalities. So that's a key assumption in all of co-learning. All right, that's all, folks. Um, so transference, three key examples, three key paradigms. First one is transfer, where you have a large model and you're trying to transfer information to a smaller one. Co-learning looks at learning a joint model, where the other modality, which has more data, is either used as input or to help you predict during training. At test time, you throw it away. And finally, model induction. You keep two separate models, really suitable for nowadays if you have two APIs and so on but you can still interchange information when they pseudo label or exchange information more at the output label space, okay? Many more dimensions um, and open questions for future work. Cool, any final questions about transference?
If not, thanks everyone.